And um, our speaker today is Andy Moore. He's an honorary research associate of the geology department of Rhodes University, which is in Grahamstown, as we all know, and um, a diamond prospector, mainly in Botswana. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Andy. Thanks, Darlene. Oops. Why aren't we getting things working? Uh, right, uh, th this talks on kimberlitic olivines and whether these are cognate phenocrysts or perlitite xenocrysts. Uh, before we kick off, just to introduce my co-workers in crime, uh, Gabby Costens at Rice University in Houston uh, in the States. He's got PhDs, two PhDs, one from Jean Monnet University in France and the second from Bucharest in Romania. Uh, uh, he's a Romanian uh, um, uh, originally. Alex uh, is from Austria. Uh, he's got a PhD at the University of Salzburg and uh, he's at uh, West University in Palapi in Botswana. Now, um, just as you have to show warning signs when you give promotionals, uh, the, the red is one that uh, 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 Barry Dawson raised many years ago and uh, pointed out that the only common feature about Kimberlites is their variability. So uh, just keep that in mind with any statement made. But uh, bearing in that in mind, uh, olivine is always the dominant phase in Kimberlites and uh, it's divided in, in terms of size into large olivines or macrocrysts which are often rounded and then smaller microcrysts, uh, which can be euhedral. Uh, the traditional boundary line between microcrysts and macrocrysts uh, used to be uh, half a millimeter. It's been suggested that this should be set at a millimeter now, but um, I'm not sure that this is uh, important. It, it's, it's an artificial construct because as we'll see, uh, Kimberlitic olivines show a wide range in size and also in texture. And this is illustrated in this slide. Uh, on, on the left is uh, a, a rather simplistic study I did um, some time back where I measured the long axis of every olivine in, a, in different kimberlites. And there's a continuum from the, the large olivines through to the uh, smaller olivines. And uh, um, this seems to be a common feature, although if you do enough olivines such as monastery, this would probably be uh, an exception to the rule. But as a general generalization, continuous size crystallization. Um, this simplistic study was repeated by Moss and co-workers with a much larger number of olivines, and they came to the, the same conclusion that uh, olivines show a continuous uh, size population and they suggested that this looks like a single population possibly with a shared parogenesis and uh, textures where you have uh, such a range in size of the phenocrysts down to ground mass is known as seriot you see it in some basalts and uh, to my knowledge, it, it hasn't been associated with the xenocryst origin. I don't think this was even considered. But as a, uh, what this means is that uh, you could say that kimberlites have a seriot texture, wide range in, in size down to the ground mass. Uh, this is nicely illustrated in this image from work by Dima Kamenetsky and co-workers where you've got large olivines which are rounded or angular and when you get down to the small sizes you see that a large number of them are, are euhedral if the, if the kimberlite is fresh enough. Now uh, there's been long debate as to whether the olivines are xenocrysts or phenocrysts uh, and we have to start off by pointing out that some are undoubtedly xenocrysts there, there's no question about this so the question is really the proportion that are xenocrysts. Uh, Mike Skinner and co-workers in the early days suggested that the large rounded olivines, uh, the, the, the macrocrysts, are largely xenocrysts, 
but the smaller euhedral ones are, are phenocrysts, cognate phenocrysts. And I think Mike still holds this view. Unfortunately, I haven't sp spoken to him for several years. Uh, more recently, the view has um, started emerging. I think, in fact, what one would say there's a consensus that the cause of all of the olivines are xenocrysts, and that these are, are derived from disaggregated mantle pyridotites. What I want to talk about today is uh, a minority view, and that's that uh, the majority of the olivines are in fact cognate phenocrysts. So we're talking about majorities, not all olivines. Uh, why is this important? Uh, firstly, if um, most olivines are cognate, this implies that uh, primitive kimberlite magmas are, are very magnesium rich. If most of them are xenocrysts, it suggests that the uh, primitive magmas are magnesium, silicon poor and carbonate rich. And it's been suggested that uh, the proportion of uh, xenocryst olivines may be relevant to understanding diamond potential of kimberlites. And of course, petrologists have to worry about something. Now, the uh, lines of evidence for suggesting a xenocryst origin are, there, there are a number of them. What this diagram illustrates is olivine cores, which are, are the circles, olivine rims, which are the edges. And there are two fields. The, the blue line is the field for olivines in peridotites. And um, this line shows olivines in megacrysts or it should be more correctly the uh, chrome poor megacrysts suite. Uh, megacrysts have been divided into two suites, one chrome rich and one chrome poor. This would definitely be the chrome poor suite. And it's been pointed out that, uh, that these are worldwide peridotites. And if you analyze olivines and kimberlites, most of them fall into either the peridotite suite or the megacris suite. The, these two suites show some overlap. And it's suggested that only the rims of olivines uh, illustrated by these squares crystallize from the kimberlite. So um, a correlation between composition of cores of olivines and other mantle peridotites or mantle derived megacrysts. But um, if, if you start off just from a theoretical point of view, this is actually quite an unusual conclusion. Uh, th this is the first phase diagram I was uh, exposed to by Morna Matthias, who will be remembered very fondly by the many students who she taught at UCT. And as you all know, this is the phosphorite phalight uh, diagram. If you have an olivine of this composition and you heat it above the solidus, the first melt is going to be more iron rich. If you take an iron rich olivine above the liquidus, cool it down to the liquidus, the first olivine that crystallizes is going to be more magnesium rich. Or if you want to look at this differently, if you generate a magma uh, in equilibrium with mantle olivines, it could certainly, in principle, uh, at least crystallize olivines of similar composition. So uh, this diagram puts the first question mark on the xenocryst model, at least a question mark, I think. Then if you start digging deeper, uh, this diagram shows olivines from the Udashnaya East Kimberlite. So these are olivines in the Kimberlite. These are olivines from mantle xenoliths from Udashnaya. Uh, they're divided into coarse peridotites, the grey, sheared peridotites, and then uh, megacrysts. The olivines in the, in the Kimberlite, the, the black or the large olivines, the macrocrysts, the grey or the microcrysts. And Sobolev actually noted that um, you couldn't actually explain all of the microcrysts in terms of olivine seen in mantle xenoliths. And um, he and his co-workers suggested that there must be mantle-derived xenoliths that have been totally disaggregated, that weren't seen in the xenolith population. So they had to assume 
mantle rocks, which they hadn't found to explain all of the olivines. And this is a paper by the same authors, but in, in, in a different publication. The yellow shows the field for sheared peridotites, the brown the field for uh, coarse peridotites, coarse granular peridotites, the green the field for olivines in diamonds, and um, the circles are olivines in kimberlites. And you can see a large majority of the olivines fall out of the mantle field. So at Udish Naya, you don't see all the mantle samples or, or mantle xenoliths corresponding to compositions that you see in the, uh, in, in the uh, olivines and the kimberlite. So there's a mismatch. This is the, uh, what, what you see at De Beers, the De Beers kimberlite. These are the olivines, show a wide range, the black again, the macrocrysts, the gray, the microcrysts. And in the lower box are the co compositions of olivines and xenoliths. This is from uh, three different studies. And these all show that olivines, uh, in, it, this is actually from all of the kimberlite pipes. And the kimberlite peridotites are remarkably refractory, in other words, magnesium rich, and there's very, very limited overlap between the, the mantle xenolith olivines and those in the, uh, that you see in the kimberlite. You do get rare dunites at, in, in Kimberley. Uh, the, these show some overlap, but these are very rare. So again, a mismatch between the olivines in mantle peridotites and those that you actually see in the kimberlite. This is, shows a similar thing for a kimberlite dike in uh, southwest Greenland. These are olivines undifferentiated in terms of size from the, uh, from the dike. Uh, here you've got the, the grey shows uh, mantle olivines from mantle xenoliths, uh, undifferentiated into sheared and granular. And there's very, very limited overlap between the olivines in, in the peridotites and uh, those that you see in the, in the kimberlite. The black are olivines from, uh, from megacrysts at this locality. This shows more overlap, um, but these megacrysts are magnesium rich and these would belong to the chrome rich megacryst suite. Um, Egler uh, uh, in, at the second Kimberlite conference described chrome rich and chrome poor megacrist suites. And at the Jericho Kimberlite in Canada, it was gem demonstrated that the, the chrome rich megacrist suite was actually in equilibrium with the host Kimberlite, or could have been. And what that means is that these olivines megacrist olivines could have crystallized from the kimberlite, which means that the same kimberlite could crystallize compositions of, of similar to those of the megacrysts. So the, the overlap between the megacrist, the chrome-rich megacrist olivines and the olivines you see in kimberlite don't necessarily imply that these are simply broken up chrome-rich megacrysts. Remembering the dis distinction between the chrome-rich and chrome-poor megacrist populations. Then if you go to, to the Leslie Kimberlite in um, Lac de Gras, you have the reverse uh, problem. The, the red are the, the cores of olivines from this locality, and they show very restricted uh, compositional spread. The crosses are olivines from mantle peridotites from uh, Lac de Gras, they show a much broader spread. So you've actually got a different mismatch here. A lot of the apparent olivines in, or a lot of the olivines that have re been reported in megacrysts, you don't see in the kimberlite. So this um, broad brush approach actually has a problem when you look in detail, or if you like the devils in the detail, at individual localities, this doesn't hold up nearly as well, or it doesn't hold up at all at some, some localities. 
Then it's been suggested that olivines, which show deformation textures such as uh, undulose extinction, must have been derived from sheared peridotites, which show similar features. But actually, there's a lot of evidence, uh, we, we discussed this in a recent paper, showing that kimberlites experience quite severe crustal stress. And this is illustrated for, these are olivines from the northern limb of the Bushveld complex. This is a study by Marina Yudovskaya and her co-workers. And um, these olivines show kink bands. Here you, 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 you see mosaic recrystallization textures. So these textures are forming in a magma at crustal depths. So what that means is that when you get undulose extinction, the olivine may come from the mantle, but it doesn't prove a mantle provenance. The, these ones must have crystallized and been deformed in, in, at crustal pressures. Then here's an olivine macrocrist from the De Beers kimberlite. It's got fractures that extend right across the rim, so these must post-date formation of the rim. And then it's got slight undulose extinction, and, and the domains of undulose extinction uh, extend right to the edge of the olivine. And so this deformation must have uh, taken place after formation of the rim of this olivine. So presumably in, in the crust. So uh, deformation textures may be reflecting a, a mantle provenance for an olivine, but it doesn't prove it. And if you look at some kimberlites, uh, this is the De Beers kimberlite, um, the majority of the olivines actually lack undulose extinction. So it's not always, it's not always common. Then some olivines in kimberlites, this, this is from the Colossus kimberlite, this is an olivine macrocrist, this is the, the ground mass, uh, and this has got a, a rounded inclusion of chrome rich clinopyroxene. Uh, similar things are seen at other localities, such as Udashnaya, and this has been presented as evidence that um, the, the clinopyroxene and the olivine are parts of an old mantle peridotite. But, but in fact, what you find is in many, and I think a majority of cases, when you look at these clinopyroxene inclusions, and, and you also get garnet inclusions at times, step Travis across two different um, pyroxenes, um, marked variation way beyond um, detection limits and inhomogeneity like this would not be a long-lived feature in, in a mantle rock. So what this is telling us is that um, this rock must have had a very short mantle residence time prior to being incorporated in the kimberlite and uh, Gabby and I have in, in a study of the Colossus Kimberlite, have argued that these uh, macrocrysts with these chrome rich megacrysts, uh, or oh, sorry, chrome rich uh, clinopyroxenes, are part of the chrome rich uh, megacryst suite and not peridotites. So, in other words, this is not necessarily a mantle peridotite. Similar features of, with, with similar zonation have been described at Udashnaya. So possibly a mantle, or, or we think a mantle, chrome rich, um, a megacrist, but not a peridotite. Then models are for uh, a xenocrystic olivine derivation, such as those pr proposed by Russell and co-workers, suggest that um, Primitive mantle melts are carbonate rich and magnesium and silica poor. And what they envisage is that during ascent, the magma reacts with um, mantle peridotite, um, assimilates orthopyroxene and the, the peridotites disaggregate and it incorporates the um, disaggregated olivine 
uh, xenocrysts. So this process produces what we call a kimberlite. It's a mixture of a, an original carbonate rich magma, assimilated orthopyroxene, and, um, and then assimilate and, and incorporated disaggregated olivine xenocrysts. But I think you can raise questions about this as well. In, in a classic old paper, Rudin, Rudin Emsley showed that the magnesium and iron ratio between olivines and coexisting melt, the, the distribution coefficient, uh, formed a constant. This is the distribution coefficient of, of 0.3. Um, so this ratio in bas basaltic systems uh, is, a, is, is a constant. So if you've, if you've got a mantle olivine, you measure its iron and its magnesium, you can predict the, uh, the magnesium number of the equilibrium liquid. Uh, it's subsequently been shown that when you have a carbonate bearing system, perhaps unsurprisingly, that uh, the distribution coefficient is, is higher these are two different studies, but they give similar higher values. So this is a very useful relationship for testing whether an olivine could be in equilibrium with uh, a, a, um, a magma or a particular bulk crop composition. And using these two distribution coefficients and testing them for typical mantle olivines in the range of 93 to 94 refractory olivine compositions. Uh, if you use a value of 0.45, it suggests that the, the bulk rock uh, liquid composition should be something like this. this. This would be the magnesium number. If you use the, the higher value, uh, you get these two numbers. So what this is predicting is that mantle olivines of FO 93 to 94 should produce, if you melt them in carbonate rich systems, magmas ranging from around about 85 to 88. And this shows magnesium numbers from um, Craig Smith's study years ago for average group one and group two kimberlites. They fall bang in the middle of this range. These are affinitic kimberlites, in other words, a largely crystal free kimberlites from the Jericho kimberlite in Canada. This is from the Kimberley pipe. And again, so these are basically glasses and they form slap bang in the middle of this range. What this means is that um, the, the iron magnesium distribution coefficients or, or uh, dis uh, distribution uh, values at least permit an average a group one or group two kimberlite and affinitic kimberlites to have been formed in equilibrium with mantle olivines. So is there evidence for this? Well, I think there, there's long been evidence for this. This shows glass inclusions uh, in megacrysts from the monastery kimberlite. The image on the left is from Rainer Jakob's old thesis and uh, he actually scratched out the, uh, the, the glass, uh, the glass inclusion, got a powder and analyzed it and showed that it had a composition uh, very closely similar to that of the, of the monastery quarry kimberlite. And he pointed out that many of these uh, glassy inclusions have these radiating fractures and he suggested that this was originally a melt and that as the um, megacrist depressurized, presumably during ascent, the glass tried to break out. So Jakob pointed out that these inclusions were closely similar to the compositions of the host kimberlite. The study has recently been repeated by um, Jeff Howarth and Steve Butner, again a megacrist from Monastery. This is one of the glasses they found, looked at numerous of these, and uh, they showed that the glass compositions overlapped 
what they call the range of archetypal kimberlites. So could these represent liquids that had assimilated orthopyroxene? Well, there's a problem with this because the megachrysts, uh, the monastery megachryst suite crystallized pretty isobarically at about five gigapascals. And experimental studies show that, um, that uh, um, orthopyroxene gets assimilated only at shallow pressures, pressures less than three gigapascals. So this suggests that these glasses, in other words, representing liquids, must have been present at, at depths too great for olivine assimilation. So direct evidence for, for liquid similar in composition to bulk rock, olivine comp uh, bulk rock kimberlite compositions. Then th there's some other dissonant features. Uh, this is an anal analysis of uh, oxygen isotopes for macrocrysts and microcrysts from the Udashnaya kimberlite. And this is the uh, range of values for olivines and peridotites from this locality. And the macrocrysts and the olivines, the microcrysts have very similar values, but these are very dissimilar to um, the values for the, the mantle peridotites at this, at this locality. It was suggested that this uh, disparity might reflect reaction of the olivines with, with a late stage carbonate rich kimberlite. But the alternative of course is that this simply doesn't support the, the uh, xenocrist model. Uh, this, this is the lot of lot of information in this picture. On the left, you've got different element maps for olivine microcrysts from the uh, Udashnaya kimberlite. Uh, this is this is the iron map, the nickel map. What this showed is that the olivines tend to have a a, a very distinct core and a rim. And what uh, Kamenetsky and his co-workers pointed out was that the edges of the core are often roughly parallel to the edges of the final crystal and in many cases such as this actually form the template for the final crystal. Now shown up in the top here are experimental studies by uh, Colin Donaldson way back and what he did was he took basaltic liquids, experimental liquids, and crystallized them with varying degrees of, of undercrystallization, uh, 10 degrees under uh, um, uh, uh, under heating, under cooling, sorry, I beg your pardon, uh, increasing to 50. And what he found was that as you had progressively more um, a cool, a under cooling of, of the magma before the olivines crystallized, you started seeing these bites in the olivine. This is not resorption, this is actually a growth feature. Uh, it's, it's, it's a skeletal crystal, and with progressively um, more under cooling, you've got progressively more um, skeletal olivines with a high degree of under cooling. You, you got these elongate skeletal crystals. So these are magmatic features, they're growth features, not resorption. And Dima actually pointed out that one of the un unusual things of, of many of the microcrysts is that they were rather equant uh, in contrast to the uh, elongate olivines that you normally see in, uh, in, 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 for instance, in oceanic basalt. And he actually pointed out that this equant shape was actually rather similar to the equine shapes that were produced experimentally. Now, um, this is a, a, an olivine again from Udashnaya. It's, it's a backscattered electron image, uh, just given a, 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 a color coding to emphasize it. And um, the core of this olivine's got a, a little bite out of it. And uh, to me, this core 
looks remarkably similar to um, this skeletal olivine produced experimentally. That's actually this one up here. And um, uh, I don't know if you can see this one. Uh, sorry. Um, this is actually uh, a, a, a core showing a, a bipyramid, uh, um, typical olivine morphology. Uh, here we've got a core that's very elongate, and it, it certainly shows a resemblance to this feature from that's produced by uh, undercooling of the magma before the crystallization commences. So um, when you start looking in detail at the cores of these olivines, which is supposed to be xenocrysts, you start seeing features which must at least uh, raise a question mark, is this actually a, a, a xenocryst, a piece of mantle peridotite, or is this ig uh, igneous? I, I would argue that it's igneous. Then when you start looking at olivine chemistry, this is for Udashnaya in Russia, uh, you see some similarities between different kimberlites, but also some interesting differences. Now, in this kimberlite, you've got an isolated population of olivines, which are fairly iron rich. We're going to ignore those because uh, that forms in that, in that chrome poor megachrist population. So these are almost certainly chrome poor megachrist. So we'll, we'll just write those off and look at these olivines. And they usually the, the dominant population, they show a range in magnesium number, generally with invariant nickel. This is nickel on the side here, magnesium number down here. And then the red circles represent the olivine edges and they form at the uh, iron rich end of this dominant field. And the upper uh, the, the, the higher magnesium olivines are around about FO93. These are actually the small olivines, the microcrysts. If you analyze the macrocrysts, they would show a very similar, largely overlapping pattern, but they'd extend to slightly higher magnesium number. So uh, a very strong overlap between the, the microcrysts and the macrocrysts. And then the olivine edges at the iron rich extreme of this range. Uh, this shows a similar feature for uh, De Beers. The triangles are the macrocrysts, the circles are the microcrysts, and the, uh, the crosses are the olivine edges. And the macrocrysts tend to be slightly more uh, magnesium rich, but there's quite a marked overlap and they show a range in composition down to more iron rich compositions with pretty invariant nickel. This is nickel down, down on the side here. And then overlapping the iron rich uh, extreme of this field, you've got the edge compositions showing a, a wide range in nickel with pretty invariant magnesium number. And if you look at individual olivines, these uh, are, off, are very often zoned, and the zonation parallels the, the overall olivine trend from magnesium rich to iron rich. If you look at a number of other kimberlites, this is um, Leslie in, um, in, in Lac de Dry in Canada. These again are the iron rich olivines, the megachris, which we won't talk about apart from acknowledging that they probably megachrysts. The majority of the olivines, uh, let's just go back one, I'll, I'll refer to these as the, the normally zoned olivine population. So they're magnesium rich relative to the uh, rim compositions. And if you look at the uh, Leslie olivines, you again show the cores define a range in, in uh, compositions, but it's much more restricted than you see in Udashnaya and Kimberley. 
but you then have the um, the cores shown by the the crosses, and these are pretty well focused on the iron rich end of the trend. The upper limit again up uh, up somewhere near ninety three. So similar upper upper limit, much smaller range in in magnesium number, and it, Leslie, uh, this is actually quite unusual, but there's actually an increase in in olivine with uh, more iron rich composition. Uh, Newlands is a group two kimberlite. Uh, the crosses again, are, are, the crosses are the edges, the triangles are the macrocrysts, the circles are the uh, microcrysts. At Newlands, the group two kimberlites show a, a more restricted range in magnesium number compared to group one kimberlites in Southern Africa. But there's a relatively limited uh, range in nickel contents. So pretty well invariant nickel, limited range in uh, magnesium number and the upper magnesium number around about 94. And then the edges um, are overlapping the iron rich end of this extreme. And then here you've got a, a very subordinate population of iron rich olivines presumably derived from the chrome rich, the, the chrome poor megacrisp population. Very similar at, at Finch, iron rich olivines, the chrome poor megacrisps, dominant field of cores of olivine showing a small but limited range in magnesium number and then the edges overlapping the, uh, the iron rich extreme um, but in this case, the edge field uh, shows a slight, defines a slight increase in magnesium number compared to the, um, the invariant trend that you, that you see at Leslie, for instance, and, and at Udashnaya. Here's Udashnaya again. So collectively, what this means is, is that um, as your normally zoned olivines extend to more, um, more iron rich compositions, you get a sympathetic, uh, beg your pardon, a sympathetic displacement of the field of edges to more iron rich compositions. And what this means is you've actually got a compositional continuum from cores down to uh, edges, although the edges mark a, a distinct inflection of the overall trend. And this suggests that you've got one continuous olivine composition or olivine population, which is basically what we concluded with the, the size distribution. If you want the, um, the, the edges to have crystallized from the kimberlite, I think you, you left with the problem of explaining why the, the, the cores should be exotic, why they aren't all also part of the same population. And this relationship, the, the displacement of the, of the edge field to the iron rich edge of the normally zoned olivines, I think is a very, very powerful argument for a cognate origin for the cause. Uh, if you want to argue a xenocryst origin, you've got to explain why this uh, edge composition shows this sympathetic behavior with the, the iron rich extreme of the, uh, of the core range. And you see a similar thing, by the way, in, in De Beers. Here, the, uh, if we go back here, edges here at 91 in Leslie, also around about 91 and a half in, in Newlands, at about 90 in uh, Finch. And here you, you may not see this, um, but, but this is about 89. And in the De Beers Kimberlite, again, an overlap with the iron rich extreme of the uh, normal zoned olivines, but um, uh, uh, both the extreme range and the field for the uh, edges are uh, at about 87 and a half. Now, um, 
nickel is a very useful e element for modeling the um, the potential formation or, or modeling crystallization of olivines because uh, nickel is preferentially partitioned into olivine relative to the equilibrium liquid and uh, way back in 87 Hart and Davis showed that the the nickel partition coefficient varies as a function of magnesium as your magnesium content goes up uh, the this value will decrease so your nickel partition coefficient is going to be lower in a magnesium rich liquid higher in an iron rich liquid but this was done for basaltic systems uh, Stewie Smith looking at Kamatiats found that this relationship didn't work uh, for magnesium rich systems and he came up with a slightly different formula this gave lower values compared to the um, the Hart Davis calculation um, and suggested that this was a better uh, a relationship to use for magnesium rich liquids then uh, a later study by Matson and Co showed that um, in fact the nickel partition coefficient is, is strongly dependent on, on temperature and um, with increasing temperature the partition coefficient will decrease and conversely so it becomes actually quite difficult to use nickel partitioning because we don't really have a handle on the temperature and pressure of olivine crystallization but in in the Matson study his magnesium rich compositions gave values that fitted well with those of Stuart Smith for his Kamatiat systems so I've tried to model nickel partitioning in, in olivine using this relationship bearing in mind all of the uncertainties and what I did was I assumed uh, uh, an initial composition similar to an average group one kimberlite and that, that's the nickel uh, content up here and I used this composition using Stewie Smith's um, relationship to work out a nickel partition coefficient I then subtracted uh, look at the black dots here subtracted 2% olivine worked out how much nickel had been taken out of the liquid what the partition coefficient was and what the nickel partition of the uh, uh, content of the the olivine was then repeated it took out another 2% and uh, recalculated the liquid and the olivine composition and um, and, and then repeated this in, in uh, steps taking out 2% olivine at a time. So this, this is showing the proportion of olivine that's subtracted. And as you take out olivine, you're going to be taking out magnesium. So this would be reflected in uh, progressively more iron rich or magnesium poor olivines. And you get a very content uh, intuitive result is that over a wide range in olivine subtraction you hardly change the nickel content of the equilibrium olivine um, a counterintuitive in, um, on, on, on face value but in fact what's happening is as you take out as the olivine takes out nickel and the magma becomes more iron rich the partition coefficient the nickel partition coefficient will increase so you actually balance subtraction of nickel by the olivine by a, a progressive increase in the uh, in the uh, nickel partition coefficient and so over a wide range in crystallization there's actually relatively little change in nickel in the olivine the squares by the way are similar uh, calculations uh, but that was using a, a much more iron rich parental magma it was a suggested kimberlitic liquid of nielsen and sand um, so 
the, the, the pattern is also dependent to some extent on the composition of the, the initial liquid. But the, the black dots assume a, an average kimberlite using the, uh, the Smith relationship to model nickel variations. So what you've got is actually a decoupling of the nickel and or a decoupling of what you'd expect at face value in the magnesium number and the nickel in the olivines. And this just shows that I've just flipped the modeling uh, graph around. This shows Udashnaya, and the modeling nicely explains why at Udashnaya you've got a range in magnesium content, but very little change in, in uh, nickel content of the olivines. And in fact, the modeling actually makes it rather difficult to explain how you can get these, this sudden very steep uh, decrease in nickel at the edges of the olivines. And I believe that this, this uh, indicates a change in, in magma uh, conditions. Uh, when you start getting into shallow pressures, and, and the magma starts uh, evolving a vapor phase, you're going to have a rapid decrease in temperature of the magma. And we know that decreasing temperature is going to, this is the Matson uh, relationship. You decrease temperature significantly, you'll increase the olivine uh, nickel partition coefficient, and suddenly the olivine's taking out much more uh, nickel and so you get a very rapid late stage drop in nickel content. So this would be slow equilibrium crystallization, evolution of, of a vapor phase, decreasing temperature and suddenly increasing partition coefficient. Um, why the invariant magnesium number? Well, actually there's, there's, there's a lot of agreement on this. Basically during your late stage in, in a kimberlite, you're crystallizing um, iron-rich oxides. And so the invariant magnesium number is, um, is reflecting the fact that um, olivines co-crystallizing with, um, with iron oxides. So the, the modeling nicely reproduces what we see. Again, ignoring these olivines, the, these are uh, um, chrome-rich, uh, chrome-poor, olivine uh, xenocrysts. Then uh, a very meticulous study uh, by Cordia and, and co-workers uh, looked at zoning in individual olivines and they also picked up this decoupling of, of magnesium number and nickel uh, in individual olivines and, and their study showed that you, you've got a homogeneous core and then you have a transition zone where there's a sharp drop off in magnesium number of the of the olivine, but it's it's characterized by a more or less invariant nickel. And this again can be explained by the the modeling results. As you take out uh, olivine, your liquid and then your equilibrium olivine will become more magnesium rich, but over a considerable range of crystallization, the olivine has basically the same um, nickel content. So, uh, so the modeling nicely explains both what you see within an, an individual olivine crystal and in the population as a whole. So, um, Basically, the conclusions are, the first I think everyone would agree with is that iron-rich olivines relative to rims are part of the low chrome megacrist suite. These are rare in some kimberlites. They appear to be more abundant in places like Monastery and Colossus, which have a high proportion of, of chrome-rich megacrists and chrome-poor megacrists. Then, some, oh, I beg your pardon. Some olivines are derived from the chrome-rich megacrist suite. Uh, 
They might be xenocrysts of chrome-rich olivines, but these olivines can crystallize in equilibrium with kimberlite magmas. So we can't rule out the possibility that some of these olivines crystallized from the magma itself. And some olivines are clearly xenocrysts. That's never in question. But the overall uh, conclusion is that the majority of olivines are cognate, that uh, kimberlites are not simply um, carbonate bearing primitive magmas that have been uh, contaminated by mantle kimberlites. And I think that we could go on, but I think we, that's a good place to stop. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, are there any questions or comments? We can always start with Norman, if you like. I'm just getting organized here. How do I get back up to whatever? Uh, Andy, always fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope everybody here is going to vote for you like I was. Um, your first slide, I think it was, showed a histogram of olivine grain sizes. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and, and you concluded that, uh, uh, that that is uh, one part of the evidence for uh, phenocryst rather than xenocryst. Um, uh, and, and that makes eminent sense. But now look at um, the source of the xenocrysts is the uh, peridotites that uh, are so familiar in uh, carried up in kimberlites. And the most uh, a common peridotite is the coarse peridotite, uh, which of course uh, contains uh, abundant uniform grain size olivine. So if you were able to create some sort of histogram of uh, peridotite xenocryst olivine grain size, it would be an entirely different histogram from the one that you had in your first slide. Agreed? Something like that. In other words, you'd have a bimodal size distribution. I exactly. Uh, um, Norman, I should have pointed that out, but uh, that would be expected. So, so what this is saying, uh, and I said this uh, in 1988, but Moss and Co, what their interpretation is, is because you've got a continuous population that you've got a single uh, parogenesis, a single, uh, a continuous size variation. You've, you've got a single population uh, with a shared parogenesis. Well, the, the thing is, uh, you you might conceal the xenocrysts in the the uh, um, in the histogram you presented, if uh, if it if the bimodal are, are pushed together and overlap each other completely. Um, so another thought might be that um, if if you have a general view of, let's say, garnet peridotites that get disaggregated into the kimberlite uh, and the peridotite grains, which are garnet, olivine, and pyroxene generally, um, they have uh, some sort of a proportional relationship to each other. Uh, so if you use that sort of uh, view of the peridotites and xenocrysts, and apply it to what you actually see as grains in the kibbalite, could you look at the proportion of garnet grains, apply the pro rata ratio to olivines, and then say, well, this shows that we do have another way of showing we do have a bimodal distribution. Um. Well, there's, there's actually uh, 
um, what I've always considered a, a major argument against the Xenocrist model is that um, peridotites are roughly, um, uh, I think it's, um, uh, you, you know better than me, 40% olivine, 20%, uh, no, 60% olivine, 30% orthopyroxene, and, uh, and then CPX and garnet would make up the rest. And so if you wanted your olivines to be derived from peridotites, you'd expect uh, roughly a two to one ratio of olivine to orthopyroxene. And in fact, if you start looking for orthopyroxenes in, in kimberlites, um, they're vanishingly rare. They really are rare. Um, I keep on pointing this out and I keep on be, being told to, to get back in my box because the orthopyroxene has been resorbed. But um, if you look at the study of, of Stone and Luth, they point out that this can only happen at... Um, shallow pressures less than three gigapascals. So I think that the orthopyroxene problem is, is really a problem. They, they're simply not there. And uh, people who want the, the majority of olivines to be xenocrists have to explain why you've lost essentially all orthopyroxenes between three gigapascals and surface when the the Kimberlite was probably going like an express train. That's my bit. Are there any other questions or comments? And it looks like you're off the hook. Got off lightly today. That's very really nice. Thank you. <laughs> well, I did by science. <laughs> um, right, if there aren't any other questions or comments, um, I think we'll call it a day. I know Andy's quite looking forward to going to have a glass of wine. So with that, I think we'll close the meeting then. Thank you very much. Have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Yeah, thanks for uh, coming to listen. Oh, thanks, thanks again, Andy. Andy. Thanks, Nolene. I'll thanks, Andy. Out. Thanks, Nolene. Thanks, Nolene. Thanks, Andy. Ciao. Thank you very much. Thanks for the organization as well.